How are you? I'm hanging in there. I'm so I'm home uh, with COVID. So oh no, yeah, it, it, it's not that. Well, I mean, no, it's a. But I had gotten my bivalent booster shot about three weeks ago, uh, and then about a week and a half ago, my children, the normal transmission vector uh, into mm -hmm. the house, they both got COVID. They had mild, pretty mild cases, just a little sneezing. And I managed to, I think, dodge it for a little bit, but then I got it. I tested positive, but I've had super mild. I mean, I've had, I've had a COVID run that has been so mild that I never would have stayed out of school. It was like the kind of allergies that, you know, I just would have gone back in. So, but yeah. I have to because, because they caught me in the, you know, well, I, I would stay home anyway, but. The PCR uh, tested positive, and uh, now I have to wait until I can get back in. Maybe tomorrow. I've been ace I've been without any symptoms for the last three days. So, so that's how Amherst College is doing it. You actually have to have a negative test to come back. To a, yes, we have to okay. have a negative test or ten days have to have gone by. So I'm trying to slide back in after day five uh, tomorrow, but. Um, but or otherwise, yeah, I have to just keep keep waiting. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's just it just keeps going round and round. You know, people keep getting it. But it sounds like because you had your booster so recently, you have had a really mild case. So that's really yeah. good. You know, yeah. that's great. I, I absolutely would have said it was fall allergies, and you know, the reason I was sniffling a little bit in the morning was just you know because things were dying. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think a lot of people are confusing it with allergies right now. Which, yeah. you know, but yeah, that's good that it's mild. Yeah, well, I never had a fever because I yeah, I didn't have a fever or any any other other symptoms, so. Mhm. Mm yeah, I just actually saw my primary care and was asking her about it cuz I had it in July and she so I was asking her about whether to get the booster. And she said, no, hold off, you know, having it gives you the most immunity, you know, out of anything. So you can hold off from getting the booster. So I have, I have okay. good anecdotal backup evidence for you there, Beth. Uh, the anecdotal evidence is um, Maria, myself, and one of my daughters all got the boosters together, but Sarah, who was doing track, couldn't do the booster shot when we were all going. And so, but she had Omicron like you, she had one of these things uh, in early in the spring. And she also had an equally mild case of this uh, as, as the rest of us did, so. Yep, yep. Looks like everyone's here. Who do we have? Mm -hmm. Anna, Amy, Jason, Lyons, Jack. Nice. My wife managed to get it twice, people. and uh, I haven't had it at all. <laughs> so, well, this was the second figure. time for my daughter Sarah. You know, the first time the entire house managed to dodge it, and the second time, not so much. <laughs> so, <clears throat> just want you to know I'm here, Linda Arsenal. Morning. Morning. Right. Well, let's see, um, John Tobias is not joining us. So we're still waiting for uh, Dave. Oh yeah, one. Brian. <laughs> and Brian, Dave and Brian. Chris, I was on Hampshire College campus yesterday and I was like, saw you out of the corner of my eye, but you were, you were in conversation. So I didn't get to go over and say hi, but. Yes, because you're coaching track. I'm that's coaching the running team. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. So I was out there, you know, yeah. looking totally <laughs> different than I do now. But I, yeah. I was like, I think it's Amy. And I, and, uh, I knew that, that's that what I figured. I was like, I'm kind of out of context. But uh, anyway, good to see you today as well.
Since we're just waiting here, Amy, what, what running team do you coach? Oh, it's over at Hampshire College. So they have a uh, they have a little cross country team, and so I go over there and run with them a couple days a week. Fantastic. Yeah. Beth, do you want to poke Brian? Oh, he's right there. Good. All right. Yeah, I think the only person that's not here is Dave Zomek, but I think we can probably start without him. Yep. You know, he'll he'll join. He is often late for meetings and will join at some point. Um, all right, so Lyons, I, I can bring up the agenda if, if you want me to, Lyons, or you can just kind of start going through the items on the agenda. I I have it on the side. If others want to see it, I'll just I'll run through it quickly and see if we have any changes. Uh, we're going to talk about the drinking water regulations, um, get an update on, on, uh, on that. Then uh, water supply status uh, in terms of drought and data on the web page. Water infrastructure projects update for well number four and Centennial. And we'll talk about the draft solar and drinking water white paper and minutes. Prove the minutes, the January meeting. Seems we should probably do that first, get it out of the way. Uh, and then approve, choose a next meeting date and then anything else. So on the subject of anything else is is do we know of anything else that needs to be added to this agenda yeah um we were thinking of talking a little bit about the um northampton road project jason can update us on the the water line and everything that's going on with that project great so we'll do that at the end or maybe under let's put oh, that okay. under uh infrastructure projects spot for it yeah before the solar discussion that sounds good yeah <laughs> um okay. so let's let's start with the minutes from the last meeting get that out of the way uh, do we have any changes comments edits corrections seeing none um, move that we accept the minutes from the last meeting. So moved. Yeah. Uh, Seconded. All, all in favor? Thank you. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. I think I vote. Do I vote? No, I don't vote. You don't yeah. vote. <laughs> we don't vote. But that's I'm okay. Fab. I'm a whole for them. I did them. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> don't vote, but you did a great job with the minutes. Um, okay. Thanks. That's out of the way. Uh, drinking water regs update. Yeah, so I'll take that. So um, as you guys know, we're doing this process of trying to update the drinking water regulations as well as the sewer regulations, um, but particularly the water regulations. I think you guys as a committee reviewed them and provided some great guidance on that. At this point, it's gone to the town council. It's actually gone through um, the TSO at this point and got some, um, I guess they made some decisions um, and, and we made some edits to it. Um, but at this point, we've got a working document and it, it went through G, GOL or G, yeah, I think I get all the acronyms wrong, but it went through the, the governance one yesterday to make sure that I had commas everywhere and that it was consistent and concise language. Um, it has to go through FinCom still, and then it's going to go back to town council. So we still have a little ways to go, but it is chugging through the process. And the big, the big chunks of things that they kind of made some changes to, a lot of it, you know, um, it's the same as what we've been doing. It was just documenting. The one thing that we got a lot of pushback on was um, the water service lines and who owns them. And as you guys know, in the town of Amherst, we the town owns the water mains, but whenever you take a private line off the main, that's the responsibility of the homeowner. That's at least how we currently operate. 
Um, and what the town council ultimately decided was that they think it's fair if the town owns what's under the town property, so basically under the road, and if the homeowner owns what's under, you know, what's on their property, which basically means, you know, in most cases where the curb box is, is going to delineate, uh, or where the property in is going to delineate the ownership of the two different um, bodies. So that's that's the big change that they've made that we've integrated into the regulations. Um, there is a financial component, which again is why going to um, FinCom to absorb the cost of all of these service lines that the town is now going to be responsible for and and going to have to fix um, when they need repairing. Um, you know, there's a financial component. So um, I guess that's that's the big that's what's going on with the the water regulations. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments on any of that. Okay. It seems reasonable that homeowners would own from the <clears throat> shutoff box to the house. The town would own up to the, the box. Yeah, it's just a change where right now it means people if they didn't maintain their line, they could kind of wait out till the town <laughs> owns it. Um, and it also means that we're, you know, potentially absorbing some um, some service lines that might have led service in them, and we don't have records of any of it. And so it, there's going to be a, it, it's not, you know, it's not a hundred percent easy, but that that's what the town decided, and that's fine. We just have to we just have to fund the decision that was made. I think the biggest switch in my mind is that they were all installed by private contractors. The town would traditionally do the tap at the main and the road, and then the rest was done by a private contractor. I mean, we did, town was doing some inspections, but really early on in history, I'm not sure how well they were inspected, I right. suppose. And I don't know how good our records are. So we yeah, our records are know. probably 50%, yeah. maybe. So. But I, I would expect in all those cases that property owners of today, you know, have no knowledge of, of, of who, who was contracted and who, who put in the original uh, line either. So, um, yeah. Well, depending on the age. Yeah. Yeah. If you're first owner, you know who did it, but. But would this mean then I, I could see going forward, if this is always going to be something that the town will own, would we then or would you guys then uh, say that any new line being tapped and would have to be um, done by the town or, or you know, uh, do you want to see more oversight at this point now? Going I forward? mean, even, even currently, if you do any work like that, you're supposed to get a permit to be able to do it. So the engineer is supposed to oversee it. It's just... It, People, private contractors aren't, aren't always 100% compliant. Sometimes they try and sneak it in in the weekend and, you know, hope we don't see what they're doing. Um, well, but so then in also case, in the past, I think we didn't have the staff to even support being able to see that or to make sure that we got the report. So especially as we go further and further back, the yeah. um, it's not the best paper trail. So, mm -hmm. but when we didn't own it, it... Like if we had owned it all along, we would have kept paper trails of what we own. Us not owning it meant that we didn't even have uh, the paper trail. So I think I think it adds a huge cost if we when we go forward, considering like paving a road in a in a relatively old neighborhood, we really need to consider, you know, the investment we're putting down on top. Do we need to go dig up every service and replace it or it's kind of puts us in a weird conundrum where, you know, we used to send out letters before we paved a road. Like if you're having problems with your water or sewer, please get them fixed now um, before we repave the road. But now it's looks like it's going to be on us. So I guess maybe that streamlines it, but it adds a huge cost. If we, if we just blanket say, let's replace them all. They're all a hundred years old. Um, that yeah, it, means it, we it, pave it, one it, road instead of five. It, there should be some, you know, one might think there might be some ability to do some cost sharing there, but absolutely, you know, it does sound like the town should be in charge because when those things are looked at, they should be done in that moment in time where you're digging up the old road and repaving the new road. 
whereas homeowners may have no ability to do that at that particular moment in time. So. Well, you, you, yeah, we could debate, we could debate this all day. I mean, the point is that's, that's the decision that the town council made and the new regs are, are covering that. So certainly they agree with you, Anna. And um, yeah, so that's, you know, you can, you can sense our stress with just the additional workload, but that's, that's not a, you know, the town is making the decision for the, the homeowners and protecting the homeowners and, and that's great. Uh, if there's nothing else, let's move on to water supply status. How's our drought right. going? Well, <laughs> let me let's um, let's share the usual web page and we can talk about it. All right. Um, so yeah, as you're all probably very aware, there was definitely a drought. Um, the summer and we're, we're, we're sort of coming out of it at this point. Um, the last update from the state drought task force was on September 8th. And so this is our water supply, water, Amherst water supply status webpage. This is how it looks currently. Um, they were gonna have a meeting, I think in close to the end of September, September 22nd, I think, and it got canceled. So their next meeting is now the beginning of October. So maybe in the next week, two weeks. Um, so their last update was that the Connecticut River Valley <clears throat> remains in a level three critical drought um, based on their data and whatnot. And so, you know, we've got this, this statement on our page and we keep updating it with what they say um, and our, um, sort of uh, conclusion about the whole thing is that we've been keeping a close eye this whole summer um, on our water levels. And we felt like the town um, has been capable all summer of providing water. So we haven't um, initiated any conservation efforts, but we always recommend all residents to follow um, water conservation tips and ideas. And we have some of those on this page. Um, so where we're at right now, um, uh, one big improvement is that well number four came online June 1st. Um, so all summer we've had well number four, uh, working wonderfully. So we're back to that providing 30% Atkins Reservoir, 30% well three, 30% of our water and well one and two are, are sort of smaller providers and well five is a backup, but you know, our decisions this summer having to do with drought, um, really having well number four online played a big part in us feeling very comfortable with the water supply. Um, and this is Atkins Reservoir levels right now. We can click on this. Um, and this, I thought I had updated it a little bit more than this. We have, we've been keeping a close eye. So this I believe is maybe into the first week of September. Um, the newest graph I've seen that goes to September 18th, basically the red line comes straight out. So it's sort of maintained the same elevation um, up to about September 18th. And I think we've gotten more rain since then. Yeah, right now we're at seven, nine or something, which means still, you know, okay. nearly October 10th, we're still kind of at that same level right in there somewhere yeah okay and yeah and so that's closer to almost over here by October 1st and we're still at about where if you can see my cursor um so we're about right there um so we're looking pretty good in terms of Atkins Reservoir Um, yeah, and then water consumption, this is updated through August. Again, we update it every month. So in the next week or so, I'll be adding the September consumption data. Um, up in August, when the students came back, um, again, overall, though, if you look at 2022, it's the red bars. We are below, say, you know, 2019 is the last kind of normal year we had because pre-pandemic to comparing it to the blue bar and the purple bar, 
because the blue bar's 10 year average. Um, 2022 has pretty much consistently again been lower than um, than those years here were about even with the average a little bit above 2019. Um, but for August, we were up pretty high. I think partially that does have to do with um, the drought and that people end up watering even a little bit more during the drought. And then it certainly is a response to the students coming back. Um, and precipitation. August again, we're here. Um, you know, I haven't seen the monthly data yet for precipitation, but I believe we jumped above 2021 20, and we're in this area somewhere. Amy, have you seen more recent data? I, I did that update on September 15th that we sent out to like the universities. And I know at that point we were above the 2020, even for kind of the mid month markers. So okay. um, yeah, we've had some good rain. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so here's this is 2016 drought year, obviously a really, really low year for precipitation. Um, so we are, we have always been above that this year, which is great. Um, but it, it definitely was a, a low year, especially July. I think July was, oh, it looks like actually June, pretty flat line there, um, where it was both dry and hot. Um, so it was a dry summer. Um, and that's that. That's where the water supply is at. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? I have a question about the wells. Um, you, it's listed you know, what percent of the, of the production each well is providing, what percentage of that well's um, capacity is being used for each of them? I'm sure they're all different. I think, yeah, I think they're all, they're all different. Um, Amy, you might know the best. Yeah, you're you're gonna test my memory here, Lyons. We um, can figure it out too, and like <laughs> provide you that information. Um, no, I mean know. Atkins Reservoir. I think technically it has a safe yield of 1.5 mgd, and if we're using about a third, I think we're actually doing like you know 700 gpm, which is just under one mgd. Um, you know, so you're operating, you know, just uh, you know about at about two thirds capacity, which is how we like to operate it using, you know, two treatment trains and having one spare that we can be cycling through. Um, well, three, uh, I don't know, Jason, if you know this offhand, I feel like the, one the capacity of that, is capacity. The, um, well, what the, like basically the safe yield of that is. I've got it down here. It might, this might be old, but I got 1.25 MGD. That sounds about right. Yeah, and so again, we're doing just under one MGD there. Um, and then well four, I think is maybe 1.4 MGD. Yep. And again, we're doing, you know, just a little under one. So none of them were pumping to the maximum capacity. That's great. Yeah. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> okay, so let's, um, if there's no, Questions about that? Let's move on to water infrastructure projects and well four. Um, okay, I'll take well four. Amy, you can take Centennial. Um, so as I just said, well four came online June 1st um, and it's been great. <laughs> um, but just, I just wanted to note a couple things that the DEPs asked us to do. Um, because they're sort of considering it uh, bringing on a new source. One was some additional PFAS sampling, which we've done, and we haven't had any detections. Um, and then lead and copper sampling, which we just we just finished 
one round of it, we have we have to do some lead and copper sampling twice this year. So we had to do some this fall. We'll do it again in the spring. And they increased us to um, 60 houses from 30 houses. Um, if 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 everything is fine with both rounds of the lead and copper sampling, we can apply for a waiver and they'll DEP will allow us to reduce back to where we were, which was doing lead and copper every three years and doing 30 houses. Um, so that was just one of the requirements. I, I, I'm i sure there were a couple other things they were asking us that Amy might know that we had to do um, as that well came online, but um, so Those far so good. Ones. Those are the major ones, yeah. So, so far so good with well number four. Um, how, how are those houses chosen? Yeah, so um, DEP, I don't know, I think we've talked a little bit about the lead and copper rule, the federal lead and copper rule is being, has been revised, but we don't have to actually meet the new requirements in terms of like sampling technique and where you sample until 2024. So right now we're still following sort of the old method, the old, which DEP put together, organized with forms and all the rest of it. Um, number of years ago. So we still followed that method um, this year, which is, you know, your first group of houses that you want to be sampling or anywhere where you're aware of a, uh, a lead service line or a gooseneck or anything, anything where you're aware of, um, which we at this point don't have, don't know of any. Um, and then the next criteria is actually houses built between 1983 and 85 because that was a prime time for putting copper piping in that had lead solder. And we have a lot of houses in Amherst that happen to actually be built during that time. Um, so that's our main group that we select from. Um, and we had had a, a list of 30 that had been approved by DEP and had been using it for a number of years. And with this round, we had to add another 30 um, and they all came from that group. I'm just curious, so the same 30 or different 30 every time, but from that group? The same, so you you make a list and it, it becomes your your sort of your sampling plan and it gets approved by DEP. And that is really the same 30 that, that you use this, this round, we had to add 30 additional ones. So there was about 30 who had gone through the program before and now there was 30 new participants. Well, and to be clear, I mean, if we're nitpicking down into it, you need to have 30 samples that are analyzed. So we actually choose 45 houses. And so there's a little bit of variety because there's a house that maybe did it one year and then doesn't the next year. So it's not the same 30 houses and that's it, but it might be 20 or 25 of them overlap. And then a couple of new ones kind of get rotated in and out. And this one, we had to actually identify 80 houses. And ultimately, I think we collected what did you say about like 63 samples? 63 so, samples. Um, yeah, it changes, you know. There's a little changes. People, but yeah, even. people who who maybe were on our list in 2020 when we did it, but then um, didn't end up filling their bottle or didn't, then I, I you know, we kind of remove them and, and add new ones. Um, you know, there's about close to 200 houses in Amherst that were built during that time period, 83 to 85. Um, and I, you know, I think the, as we've done this so many years, I feel like we've probably covered that whole group at some point. Right. Onward to Centennial. Onward to Centennial. All right. I, I can't quite recall what the update was when we, last talk, so I might repeat some of what um, what I said last time, but um, we, Amherst was selected for um, an SRF loan, that's a state revolving fund loan. Um, so that basically means we're getting some funding to help support um, the construction of Centennial. What that, that has slowed down the process because now we have some additional um, an additional body in the DEP has to approve everything. And, you know, we had some additional like financial paperwork and everything that went along with that. Um, so at this point, everything has been submitted to the DEP. Um, 
the designs are finalized in terms of all of the local permitting. So even just the permits that we need from Pelham to do this project and everything, all of that is together. And we're just waiting for the thumbs up from the DEP um, to be able to bid the project. And um, so we're hopeful that that'll happen sometime this fall. And so then construction can start uh, sometime in the spring. So That's great. chugging along. I don't know if anybody has any questions on that or if if I skipped time periods between last update and now. Okay. I don't really have anything to but Seth, that's fantastic news. Um that that so much is being being covered and is going to be started this this uh this spring. So yeah, we were fortunate with the SRF loan and then because because of a couple criteria with um, like the income bracket that Amherst is in. And then I think like, because we're a- um, Mini entitlement. Uh, yeah, there was, there was an entitlement. Yeah, there were a couple things that basically meant that we actually get a lower percentage loan and we actually get um, the state is gonna cover, um, it's basically 20% of our request there. It's gonna be, paid for by the state. So um, we're very, we're very fortunate. That That's great, especially with interest rates. <laughs> <So>. Yes. <laughs> um, Jason, you want to do the route nine? Route nine? Yeah, sure. Um, so the I mean, the water line up to well, the water line's all set. Don't drive the road yet, but the water line is is in. It's 100%. It's functional. It passed all its tests. All those side streets are now being fed off of the new 12-inch main. Um, we haven't had any complaints. Um, I don't know, Amy, Have you, you haven't heard. There was a couple of side streets like Blue Hills and, which I think it was mostly Blue Hills, maybe Sunset, that we used to get complaints for dirty water, so we'd have yeah. to additional flushing rounds. I don't think we've heard from them since the new main went live. Um, just just the process of installing the new main sort of acted as a, a flushing project anyways, because you have to flush and chlorinate and, and repeat. Um, so that may be keeping their water extra clean to begin with. But in the long run, we've got a new 12 inch main that runs all the way down there and now you know, provides good, hopefully good circulation through there so that we don't have any stagnant sort of dead ends with the multitude of pipe sizes that was there before. And it was sort of went from eight inch to six inch to nine inch to very random sizes all up and down the road. So it's all one consistent 12 inch pipe now and it should be providing nice circulation through all that area, we hope. Um, so yeah, we're gonna knock on wood and say it's done, it's hooked up, it's connected and and uh, all the house services that were fed off of Route 9 have been swapped over to the new main. So um, it's going pretty well. We had to replace a fair amount of sewer services that crossed Route 9, um, but that's un sort of unrelated, but they were, very old sewer services and and we technically don't own the sewer services but we don't want to see the road ripped up after a year later so there was a lot of old clay services that we just paid to replace paid caracas to replace that were didn't fall within the state project funds so but other than that it's worked out very well great glad to hear it's progressing mm -hmm. They should uh, just for everybody's like general knowledge, traffic wise, they're starting full depth reclamation or plan to be starting full depth reclamation uh, next week, first week of October, and they will be detouring. There's going to be some sort of a detour plan, I believe, which involves Amity. I, I have that meeting later today, so I don't know yet, but that was what was discussed earlier in the year. So it'll probably be reduced to one lane in one direction and Amity Street in the other direction. It's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so like. just know that no, no Christmas or you Valentine's Day or, you know, I, we're not exactly sure. But um, yeah, they, it's they, it's still you still haven't seen it at its worst. Oh, but that gives so you exciting. a hint. <laughs> so avoid it. Just avoid it. Alex. At all costs. Yeah. OK, thank you.
Uh, moving on to the white paper. Okay. Um, so, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, I just put together a sort of a little presentation of just to summarize the paper a bit. And um, so I sent it out to all of you and it got posted on our web page, uh, the committee's web page for the public to look at if they were interested. It's in draft form. Um, so this was a product of subcommittee and it of uh, Jack and Brian and Lyons and Amy and myself. And we met many times. We were trying to meet every two weeks. I think, I'm not sure when we started this, um, in the spring maybe. Um, and we we were pretty good about meeting. Um, we divided the document up and everybody worked on certain sections. Um, and I, I, I think it, it came out pretty well. You know, it's basically um, a research document. So we went out, out to just find sort of the current, current information, current knowledge on the impacts of large scale solar on specifically on drinking water. That's really what we were looking at. So, um, and then the purpose of the document is to be used by the solar bylaw working group and hopefully uh, permitting committees and boards from the towns where our watershed is, Shootsbury and Pelham, um, if they eventually get any solar project applications. At this point, nothing that I know of has been submitted to those towns. But um, you know, the idea is that those permitting committees would be looking for Amherst input since it is our watershed. Um, so that's what the that was the goal of the paper. And I hope you all had a chance to look at it a little bit. And um, like I said, I just wanted to summarize some of the conclusions. So I can just read some of these, um, I can move it over <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so stormwater management, both in the short term, meaning uh, during construction and in and long term management of the site has proven to be potentially damaging to water resources if not conducted properly. We we found and in the paper there are some examples of projects um, nearby in the Connecticut River Valley where during construction, especially um, stormwater wasn't managed appropriately and there were some sort of catastrophic results in terms of erosion and sedimentation into nearby resource areas. So um, some of our conclusions are that managing stormwater at solar sites is more cha challenging than a typical development project due to the large size, typical, typically large size, large footprint of the project and typically that they're placed on sloped topography. Um, so that our conclusion is that more robust erosion control and erosion control and monitoring during construction and certainly until the site gets revegetated, um, but then even into you know the first year of operation of the project. Um, we also concluded that the current research indicates there are don't there are no long term don't appear to be any long term impacts from contaminants originating in the solar panels themselves and their associated equipment. Um, you know, in the in the paper we refer to the actual panels themselves and then things like um, transformers um, as not seeming to be showing any long term impacts. Um, however, the battery energy storage systems, which are now really being pushed and recommended to go along with solar projects, we found in the research that there does seem to be a threat of uh, release of contaminants from those systems in the events of uh, if there was a fire. Oops. Um, and then we also concluded that so far, the impact of solar arrays on hydrology um, seems to show that it, it increases runoff. So installation of a large scale solar project would actually increase runoff and groundwater infiltration. Um, uh, 
And then some of the highlights from our recommendations, we came up with sort of distances from um, drinking water wells and from surface water sources that we recommend for the disturbance area or the clearing area of a solar project. Um, we've got 100 feet from private wells. What does that say? I'm so busy. Got things on top of things. Um, 100 well, 100 feet for private wells, 400 feet for public drinking water wells, 200 feet from reservoirs, 200 feet. So from the bank of the reservoir, 200 feet from the bank of all zone A tributaries to reservoirs. Um, and then we definitely recommend PFAS free solar panels. And we also then increased the distances from those same resources in terms of installing um, the battery storage systems. We increased it to 300 feet from a private well, 600 feet from a public water supply well, 400 feet um, from the bank of reservoir and from the banks of the of tributaries to reservoirs. Um, there's other recommendations in the in the report. I, I didn't feel like I, we needed to list them all right here. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to cl clarify what we're doing today in terms of the paper. Um, and it's it's just we're taking everybody's comments, seeing if people see changes and comments that they want made um, to the to the draft document. And then we're basically voting. Did you agree with the conclusions and recommendations and agree to finalize the paper um, as is right now or with any changes that we agree upon during the meeting this morning um, or you're voting that you don't agree with the conclusions and recommendations and you'd like to see further work done um, on the paper. So maybe I'll just leave this up and I guess we're gonna, we'll open it up to comments from the committee. So um, uh, one of my comments was just in the uh, regulations regarding the building and maintenance of wherever the battery energy storage system is located, because it sounds like that is done at different installations very differently. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not you wanted to, to put in any more sort of define, or is there already like a code for how those buildings have to be built? Because one would imagine that even if there is a fire at a battery installation, if you had it in a trailer or something, that might be worse than if you had it in a cement block building with, you know, fire retardant, you know, so that I'm just curious is like, how, how do they do that on other installations? And how could we just, you know, basically take that threat down even more than it already is? Jack, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, well, I just wonder, with, with regard to your summaries, the one bullet with regard to where the solar development will uh, increase the runoff and increase the recharge. That was more in comparison of a conversion, say, from force uh, to a solar field. I think mm -hmm. if solar goes on a pasture or agricultural land, it's going to be roughly, you know, no change, little or no change. So I just want to make that um, comment. Yeah. And with regard to the battery storage, uh, we <laughs> there there there's much to be done, but I think there is, you know, there are best management practices that are developing. And it, I think it's continually evolving, um, but uh, so that level of detail, whether it be a trailer or a concrete building, uh, it's it's just you know it's speculative. I think most of them are going to be you know in trailer type structures. I'm not aware of any that are in you know buildings, but that would be you know an added cost to the developer. It seems to me like it'd be like a little bit of. Uh, uh, you know, you know, over design for these things. Um, but they are learning. I mean, there's been, I think there's like a couple examples that have been like catastrophes that we've learned from uh, that are stated uh, within the white paper. 
but I think we're way past that. And, you know, there's all these alarms and, you know, sensors, whatever that, that need to shut down that decrease that. But, you know, we made the points that, you know, there needs to be education of the fire department to deal with, you know, this special uh, circumstance where we're not going to be putting a lot of water or, or any water, basically, if uh, we had, you know, a thermal runaway event at one of these uh, events. But, you know, certainly I think shifting the responsibility on the developer to include, you know, the, you know, belt and suspenders approach to, you know, this event where there was failure uh, will be, you know, you know, paramount. So, um, you know, they're getting, they're, they're being implemented, um, you know, within the state uh, via the, the uh, incentives or, or, or mandate by the, by the state. So, but there is no existing sort of like guidance, which is kind of crazy, but that's, that, that's just where we are on the subject. Okay, um, Lyons, can you see the hands or do you want me to call on people? Looks like- I, Chris, I can only Chris, see uh, five people. <laughs> Yeah, well, so Chris has her hand up and then, then Dave. Chris, go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, I, I guess I had two. I just wanted to make sure I understood um, that, it, that we, this is forming the foundation of recommendations we're making about a solar bylaw that would be created in the town of Amherst. Like that, I just wanna make sure I understand kind of where we're going on that. So things that we may recommend recommend may or may not end up in the final bylaw. Is that right? Okay. And then yes. I guess I, I just wanted to highlight and make sure I understood it. One of the things that jumped out at me in the white paper was around the erosion and sediment control um, that seemed really important in it. And I wanted to make sure I was clear on what it sounds like we're recommending um, because of the potential for erosion and um, sediment problems that are higher than maybe in a regular construction project, which is what the conclusions say, that we're recommending additional erosion and sediment controls with it seemed like more oversight and more, um, you know, kind of more stringent requirements to make sure that that doesn't happen during construction. Is that, is that one of, is, am, am I right in that's how we're yes. reading that, that we're recommending that the town take a more active role in ensuring things are going um, preventing that erosion. Yeah, I think some of the things that I, that's not in this presentation are things like all projects will be required to, you know, have a SWIP, which is an EPA NIPTES permit. Um, we're recommending that some of those details about erosion control get included actually in the bylaw so that they're sort of, in addition to them being reviewed, possibly say at the Conservation Commission, if the project is within the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission or at the planning board, that also the bylaw itself includes some language on uh, increased um, erosion control and certainly sort of monitoring. And then we go as far as to suggest some monitoring. I can't quote it exactly, but it's like every two weeks or something like that. And then we suggest having a, <clears throat> a third party um, consulting company do the, the monitoring. Um, so yeah, I think we're basically trying to push that, that that area really needs to be strong with these projects. Thank you, great. Um, Dave? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, well, first, I wanted to thank the group that put this together. I, I think it's fantastic. It's a great, it's a great, you know, document and um, really appreciate all the time and energy and effort um, folks put into pulling it all together. I had a couple of quick comments. One um, is that my hope is that the group does not vote to approve this today, as is. I would like some time uh, I've sent it to um, uh, Aaron Jock, our wetlands administrator. I've sent it to Stephanie Ciccarello, uh, Chris Brestrup, our planning director, Stephanie Ciccarello, our sustainability uh, director. Um, uh, Chris, and, and, um, Chris and Stephanie are working on, on the bylaw itself. And uh, of course, Aaron is an expert on erosion control. So I'd love to have a little bit more time. Uh, I know you just finished this, so I'd love to have a little bit more time to see if they might 
um, and I've asked them for comments to be sent through Beth to to this group. So um, I would just put that out there that that I hope you take a little bit more time um, to really um, get get input. And I know you've had some public uh, comment on this as well. Um, going back to Jack's comments, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that I think in my mind, um, you know, solar's been around for a while. A lot of a lot of projects permitted in the state. It's the battery storage piece that is new for, or newish for a lot of us. Um, we now have, you know, we now have projects in Amherst where battery storage is proposed as part of a solar project, and then we just had uh, our first standalone battery storage, no solar. There's no photovoltaics on the site, but a, simply a standalone battery storage project uh, proposed for Amherst uh, Route 116. The former Annie's Garden Store site is proposed for a standalone battery storage um, facility. So I just, you know, I think, I think, as I read the paper, it seemed, you know, I think, you know, you all were spot on, kind of saying that's an area that we need, you know, kind of uh, to be learning. I think Jack, you said we're it's evolving, and there's not as many regulations, and you know, we need to be, um, you know, just um aware of new new developments new research um uh and and be aware that there can be problems if if um you know related to fire and these battery storage units not to be overly alarmed but what happens when that when that does happen and have we taken the appropriate safeguards around those facilities so that whatever happens there if there is a fire any chemicals, anything at the battery storage facility doesn't get into uh, groundwater or um, surface water. So those were my quick comments. And um, again, thanks for, for those folks who put it together. Are there any other comments from the committee? Yeah, I have a just I was just curious. I, I read through the commentary that Beth sent out from three folks who submitted comments. Uh, I just wanted to meant, you know, get it in the minutes that we discussed it. I didn't I personally didn't find anything super relevant to the water resources recommendations that we're making. Um, the letters, you know, all three of them seem concerned about sort of the net carbon impacts, the impacts of um, deforestation sort of more broadly than than water resources. And I, I certainly thought they they made some good points, each of the comments, but um, they didn't really inform um, sort of hydrologic processes, water resources, in my opinion. Just wanted to try to get that in the minutes and see if anyone read them and, and found anything in there that they did think was useful to change our draft. Jack? Yeah, yeah Brian, good point. Um, I mean, I think that's going to be taken up by the uh, solar bylaw. You know, working committee to look at the the you know greater breadth of uh, you know environmental environmental impact um, with regard to conversion of you know existing land use to a, a solar field. But you, I I agree, Brian. Uh, good point. I would also agree, and I'd like to say that the the most recently submitted comment from. Um, Jenny Kallick, uh, uh provided some additional uh, research from EPA that I've not had time to go look into, um, but I'm I'm curious to look into it. I'm I don't know that it's going to change how I feel about any of the recommendations, but um, it Try might be. Cut. Go ahead. Sorry to cut in, cut in Anna. I, I looked at some of them. I mean, it, it, a lot of them were pretty far off base, it seemed. There was stuff about induced recharge out west. And I think, um, yeah, it, 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 some of them weren't super on topic. Okay, great. Anna, I think you have your hand up. I do. So, so Brian, uh, you you cut in, but I was going to say that. So I, I did look at some of those other EPA ones. They're not they're not uh, um, uh, uh, very applicable here uh, from those outside. And once again, I also want to say uh, thank you. This was a, a, a fantastic document, and I think what really struck me is that most of this most of uh, what was written 
about for uh, uh, hydrologic control. Stormwater controls seem really right on, on the money, um, on what I've read. Uh, but the thing that really is, is kind of like just in my brain is that the, the battery storage issue and that we don't have, you know, we, we know how to deal with, with chemicals that come out of a battery. And we know how we would build a, if I had a storage room at Amherst College that where I was putting a bunch of batteries, I would have to make sure that if a fire occurred, that like the fluids that would be, would be contained um, sort of within some, some structure. And so that's the only thing that, that strikes me as being interesting that we don't have. I, I understand that it's in flux, but um, I see no reason why we wouldn't give some guidance that we would indeed uh, uh, want that to be um, contained, um, even you know if it does cause a little bit of extra expense. So that was my only opinion on, on the rest of it. Lions, you have your hand up. I do. And you're you're leading the meeting. You can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Habits. Um, I it occurs to me that uh, perhaps we should add to Dave's list of folks to review the white paper. Um, we should add the fire department and get their input on the battery storage piece, particularly. Uh, since they're the ones that would have to deal with that. And if we're going to um, leave the comments open, perhaps till our next meeting, um, then it would give everyone in those groups uh, time to comment. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like that idea. I, you know, I think so. I think it was the comments from Jack, um, Jack Hirsch where he also he's somebody from the public who also brought up, you know, what do we do? What's what would happen if we had a fire like that? Are we sort of recommending the best protection to against something like that? And also is the fire department people sort of trained on um, how to deal with something like that? So maybe that that is an area we can expand a bit more in the paper. Um, and so, yes, taking in comment from the fire department sounds like a good idea. Beth, can you take down the? Yep. Share. I can see. Oh, yeah. Now I can see everybody. Um, so I guess uh, we did not have any members of the public show up. Oh, no, we have seven. We have uh, seven folks. Great. <laughs> um, do, do we have Jack that wants to make a comment? Yeah. Before. Yes, I would say that that we did uh, state in the paper that you know training was paramount uh, to deal with this specific uh, condition, which you know I uh, you know standard protocol for training of a, a or a emergency response personnel would not cover this situation, so that needs to be you know hardwired into the approval of uh, you know any you know solar field that they are. You know, probably contribute to the training if the training isn't there already within the Amherst Fire Department. But that's a great idea to have them uh, take a look at this at this point in time. Yeah, they may have experience or knowledge of uh, battery storage catastrophes somewhere else that we're not hearing about that they're getting through their circles, and and that may inform you know if if a uh, particular type of structure is recommended to reduce uh, impacts, um, they could provide that input and it could be, whether it's part of the paper or, or it goes to the, to the bylaw committee, uh, doesn't really matter, but I, I do think it would be a good way to get them to start thinking about it and provide input, so. Anything else from the committee? I just want to apologize. I've got to go in a minute. Thanks for your uh, help on this paper, Brian. Yeah, I want to thank Brian and Jack for a huge amount of work they both put into making this paper happen. So thanks. Uh, 
do we have anyone from the public that wants to speak? I can't see any of them, but so you'll have to. Oh, I thought I made you a co-host, but you can um, you can see anyway. it if you if you click on participants. There's a tab for panelists and a tab for attendees. So if you click on the attendees, you can see. But it looks like Eric has raised his hand. Yeah. So oh, oh. there it is. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> Learn something Eric. new today, Lions. <laughs> <laughs> great. It's great. I love it. <clears throat> Zooming. Uh, so, so if you highlight that person, you can let them talk. Yeah, I did. Okay, great. Awesome. Eric, Eric, you're ready to go. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your um, your very hard and, and timely work on I, what I think is a critical, uh, critically um, uh, important um, aspect of, of the, the work of the Water Protection Supply Committee to, to do. Um, in January, at your January meeting, um, I raised the issue about um, well, well water. What is the consequence of, of clear cutting and removing a forest on well water? And um, I was um, I, uh, I was forwarded uh, to the uh, Board of Health which evidently has jurisdiction over uh, the private well wells in in our town, uh, evident, and in the report uh, you cited that it was cited at three and a half to four percent of the households in Amherst um, uh, are are rely on well water for 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 our water. Um, my my concern um, with the report. Um, and um, the, and I am uh, uh, the, in in the title of your 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 uh, committee, Water Supply Protection Committee. I felt that the protection, particularly of the well systems, was really glossed over and not not uh, delved into. Um, I think the report, kind of a very, very in the very beginning. Um, makes the assumption based on the Energy and Climate Action Committee's um, notion that uh, uh, we, we cannot accommodate our solar requirements simply through, through, um, uh, through rooftops or other, other, um, uh, other means um, and that we were going to have to um, essentially uh, deforest. My, my, my concern is um, when that happens, and I've done uh, some research myself. I'm not a hydrologist, so I rely on other scientists like Dr. William Mumwa. And Dr. Mumwa, in uh, the uh, paper that he co-authored called The Great American Stand, um, uh, says in bold letters that two thirds of America's fresh water supply filters through forests. So again, I'm not a hydrologist. So if we if we deforest, and and the the water runoff is increased drastically, it's not absorbed by by our forests anymore. So where is our water going to come from if it's running off uh, at a very very uh, rapid and drastic rate? In fact, there is a there was an article in the New York Times last week that cited that over 70%, there was a 70% increase in, 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 in uh, uh, rainfall during, during um, our um, more recent um, uh, 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 you know, heavy storm incidences. So I'm concerned that uh, the well water and, and um, how, we, how people who rely on well water is being kind of overlooked. Um, I think it's a real, a real concern. And um, I think that the, the um, you know, how, how can we rely on a report that really has not delved into the private well water system as completely and as thoroughly as I think it should. Um, so I would ask that, um, someone from the town, whether it's the Water Supply Protection Committee or the Board of Health, look at how private wells can, uh, um, can feel 
secure that we are out, the consequences of climate change, the consequences of, of deforestation for solar is not going to affect private wells. Thank you so much for your, your work. Uh, thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, Brian just left. <laughs> How convenient of him. <laughs> so uh, Brian um, worked on, researched uh, the section of the paper that was water quantity. So really looking at the current information and knowledge on um, taking down trees, clearing or, or in some cases not clearing uh, when you're building a large solar array. Sometimes they're put in fields and he looked at really how that affected the volumes of water, uh, where they go when it precipitates on a solar field versus a forest or versus a farm field. And um, I guess then that impact on the, the volumes of water that we're able to use from our wells, public or private. Um, and I don't really wanna speak for him and I wish he had stuck around. Um, Jack, but, Jack has his hand up, so I don't okay. know if he wants to speak to that. Jack. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm quite familiar with Beth, you know, that um, on this topic as well. But anyway, I, I kind of beg to differ with Eric. I think we really, we have some guidance document from the Mass DEP with regard to public water supplies. And we took that into consideration along with some basic, you know, uh, hydrologic knowledge of the differences of you know water budgets of forest land versus grassland, which is a solar field basically becomes a grassland, and uh, we took all that into account, and we you know we put in buffers that we thought were consistent with the Mass DEP policies uh, that were uh, extended for public water supplies, which uh, again take you know orders of magnitude more uh, groundwater out of uh, are uh, the aquifers than a uh, a private well. So I, you know, in my opinion, I feel like we we really covered that uh, to the best, uh, you know, that, <laughs> uh, using, you know, current knowledge uh, there. So, um, but, so I think we're trying to be protective of, of the private well owners, you know, in addition to our, our public water supplies within our conclusions, recommendations within the white paper. Thanks, Jack. Um, Mike Lipinski has his hand up. Uh, okay, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I'm Mike Lipinski, uh, 167 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. And I hope that you'll follow uh, Dave's recommendation and certainly just look at this report as a first draft that requires more input from other people, especially other town boards. A couple of things that I think are, are missing from the report, and I think it, it's probably one of the most important things that seems to be coming up over and over again for me in this discussion today is there's no mention of size. And th there has been some mention of topography uh, as far as most of your, your watershed is sloping, but there's been no mention of size. So some of the statements that are being made about, you know, very little effect, um, that might apply to something that's the size of five acres of clearing. And maybe it applies to something that's 10 or 15 acres of clearing. But you have a watershed that's primarily forested and you have projects that have been, they're not formally proposed, but they certainly have been lingering for the past couple of years to clear hundreds of acres of forest that's either in your watershed or near your watershed. I think any calculations you make, they might work for small amounts of forest clearing, but we're talking large scale forest clearing. And we're not talking about the type of forest clearing you see where 
a logger comes in and removes a selective numbers of trees and leaves the stumps in the ground and the other bushes around. You're talking about clearing that basically takes the entire forest ecosystem out of commission. And as a water protection committee, I think that should concern you if the area where you're getting your water from is not the same as it was. And if it's a five acre site or something, I can see where you could say, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's five acres of forest that got turned into a field. But we're talking about huge facilities. I can't see how you wouldn't look at that and say, this is a concern for us. It's dramatically changing our watershed. And after all, you are the Watershed Protection Committee. And I'm surprised you're not more concerned about that, but maybe you're not thinking in terms of the size and scale of some of these projects. To, to give you another example, especially in the battery storage area, which everyone I think has mentioned that it's critical, it's evolving, and it's something that needs more research. The facility that, that Dave mentioned earlier today, which is proposed down in 116 in Amherst, there are at least 35 sort of tractor trailer size battery units that are proposed for that site. And that's, I wouldn't call that a big or a small, that's kind of like a medium size installation as far as some of these battery storage proposals go. What would that look like, you know, sitting off Pratt Corner Road attached to that transformer that's up there on the Shutesbury border, you know, basically in the center of the Amherst watershed? Would that be a concern? What if it were 70 battery units? Some of these units go into several hundred storage containers. And you might think that that's far-fetched, but it isn't. These are the types of things that are coming down the road, and oftentimes they're put right next to substations. Another part of this battery storage business is, yes, the state is requiring people to put um, battery storage next to solar sites, and there's a, there's a logical reason to do that. I'm not going to get into the reasons why you do it as far as balancing the, the energy on, on the grid, but like the 116 site, they're also just building these things nowhere near a solar site. And the intent is to just siphon off electricity from the grid, store it, and then use it at other times. So basically you're storing electricity that's been produced by gas and produced by nuclear energy and by solar, you name it. That type of facility could easily be put off of Shutesbury Road, hooked up to that uh, substation that's up there. Is that the kind of thing that would be a concern to the water protection people if there were 35 or 50 or 100 of those battery units sitting in the water protection zone? So I think in this particular case, size does matter. And I wonder if there's any attempt in this report to put a limit on things, because right now the way it's written, it sounds like you could put in one unit or you could put in a hundred units. It doesn't matter because you're basically saying there doesn't seem to be a big problem. So please do some more work on this and uh, please um, get some more input from other sources. Thanks for doing the work. And I look forward to uh, following the, the developments as this report moves along. Great, thank you for your comments. Um, I think in part the, the size of clearing is taken into account with our um, recommendation that a um, stormwater pollution prevention plan be generated for all projects. Um, those take into account the type of clearing and the type of redevelopment and the change in surface um, conditions. Uh, and it's a fairly extensive look at 
um, those those types of changes on um, precipitation events. Um, and it's not something that's generally done um, in all cases. So if uh, we include that in our final recommendations, um, that piece of it, I think, is fairly well covered. Um, the question of size uh, is definitely an interesting one. And um, I appreciate your comments. I would say, given the time, I will make a proposal that we follow David's recommendation and send the paper to um, the, what was your list, Dave? It was the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission. Um, I added the Fire Department. Yeah, mine. I guess focused more on on staff review, fire department, planning, uh, wetlands, um, and our sustainability director. But I would defer to the group on whether and Jack. Uh, I'm sorry, Jack was a member of the planning board, but is no longer. Is that right, Jack? You you moved off. But I I would defer to the group on whether you you want um, whether you'd like review by the planning board or or the concom or whether this is a staff review so i, I would defer i'm fine to with group. staff review i was not uh okay. intending to um create more work for the boards themselves unless the staff of those boards feels it's important so that's fine um i do think it would be good to get additional input and we can move this along to its next uh, logical um, step at our next meeting. Um, yeah, I might just suggest, you know, we'll, we'll certainly do that. We'll send, we'll get these people to review and comment, but we may uh, have another meeting before January, you know, we'll probably mm -hmm. be sending out info to the committee about probably have just warning you, we're, we're going to have another meeting then. But that all sounds good to me. Jack has his hand up again. Jack. Yeah. So I I, I think that the 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 filter there I think would be the solo bylaw uh, committee and let them decide, you know, to interact with the boards versus the water site uh, protection committee, you know, interacting directly with the boards. So once it gets delivered to the um, the the bylaw working committee then I think, you know, that may be an option or not, but I think it's critical that what Dave said in Lyons with regard to, you know, the, uh, the town experts at least take a look at this and which hasn't ha uh, happened at this point, I guess. So, yeah. Um. It looks like uh, Mike Lipinski has his hand up. He's, again. He just never lowered his hand. He never his hand. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Put your hand down. There we there go. Goes. There it goes. Okay. All right. So All I guess right. we can move on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... Is there any um, other comment on? Um, sending this to staff of various town boards and committees. If not, um, let's simply make that happen, and uh, we'll we'll move along to uh, revisit this when uh, when we come back at our next meeting. Lions, if I could just add, just so Beth and, and Amy and Jason know, um, and I let Beth know this, I did send it to uh, Stephanie and um, Stephanie and um, Aaron yesterday, but maybe it, coming from you, Beth, I, I, you and or Amy as point 
staff for the Water Supply Protection Committee would be good. Maybe in one email to all of those folks, this is the official, hey, here's the draft of this white paper. We're looking for your comments and give everybody a deadline because everybody's busy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think you're right, Beth, revisiting this before the end of the year makes perfect sense because this group only meets quarterly, right? So, um, but giving giving us all a deadline would be good, you know, a couple of weeks out, give people yeah. whatever, three weeks to comment. And, and that way the Water Supply Protection Committee isn't waiting for, you know, planning to get back with this or wetlands to get back from this or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So yep, give, us, sure. give us all a deadline and, and, uh, and we'll meet it. Sounds good. Okay, so that brings us to uh, choosing a meeting date. Um, John Tobiason chimed in via email um, requesting a date near the end of January or early February, suggesting either January 26th or February 2nd. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out that I think more just to get the solar paper done so it can get in the hands of the people doing the bylaw committee that maybe we look at like you know six to eight weeks from now like give the town staff or anyone else from the public that wants to provide comments give them a month to do that and then that gives us maybe a a couple of weeks to a month to incorporate those comments or have a better conversation because um, the bylaw committee is. They're, they're chugging ahead and I know it would be helpful for them to have, you know, our, our recommendations. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. We did, we don't need to set the date for our January one at this point, because it sounds like we're definitely doing, as Amy says, one um, before the January one, or we can set the date for the January one too, whatever you guys want to do. Um, I, I got to go. I'm sorry. I got a contractor coming in. Um, let me know what the date is. I'm sure I can make it. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Thanks for your work on this, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Okay, why don't we just go ahead and set the date for the earlier meeting? Um, okay, at this point, do you have a quorum, by the way? Uh, what do we got? We, we have three. Um, yeah, so there's seven members, right? So yeah, no quorum. <laughs> no quorum. Um, what, what, I missed that. Setting. Are you setting a date? Yeah, we're just setting well, a date. Just don't do we, don't need you a do, we don't need a quorum. Yeah. You could do a doodle yeah. poll and just say, you could I'm do a doodle voting. poll or whatever. I would, a couple of dates. I was gonna yeah. I'm going to suggest November 3rd. I was Thursday. going to suggest the, the, the second week of November, but that's good too. <laughs> so, um, okay, should we go with maybe with the 10th? Just give it a little sure. more time. So, sure, the 10th is fine. Okay. For me. And so, then do we say public comments? I think we just need to officially have a deadline for anybody from the public, and we'll communicate that with the staff too. So, October 15th, October 20th. What gives oh, us time? Oh, for them to get their comments to us? Yep. All right, so we're saying the meeting is gonna be November 10th. And we could maybe give them basically four weeks. I'll send the letter today to staff and, and folks, but write the public who are on the call, submit comments by um, October 27th. So that gives them a month. Seems good. Perfect. Great. Okay. All right, I will send invites and all for the 10th and I'll send a letter to staff and uh, different departments and things for review. Great, thank you very much. Nice to see everyone. And uh, having no quorum, we're not going to 
to oh, attend the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just say bye bye. <laughs> we'll just say goodbye and we'll see you all on November 10th. So, all right. thank you very much. Sounds good. Nice to see everyone. Good day. Bye. Bye.